All right, we're live. Welcome, everybody. Hey. Uh, we're here to talk about Enemy in Shadows, the first book of the Enemy Within campaign, which, if you don't know, is widely considered one of the best uh, role-playing game campaigns out there. Um, with the fourth edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, it's got a facelift. They call it the director's cut of this, like, what, over 30-year campaign, 30 30-year-old 30 campaign. I think that's actually older than I am. <laughs> I certainly wasn't there when it first came out. No. And let's not forget to mention uh, that Graham, Graham Davis, I hope I haven't butchered his name, right. uh, was uh, invited and, and took the, the leading role in this rewriting of, of the whole story which is really nice to have one of the original content creators. He was not the lead uh, creator back then. He was a collaborator, mm -hmm. but his involvement became more and more important as the different um, chapters of the story were released. Awesome. So yeah, that, that was a, a good call by Cubicle 7. Yeah, for sure. To get somebody by the way, there. you know Dan, my name is Lemmy. You may know me from the Discord, um, the Discord server. I also ran Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay games, but in a Spanish-speaking network. And I've been a fan of Gopopa since the beginning. We awesome. really had this uh, pending, some, some collaboration between the professional casual and, and broadcastle, and I'm glad that we finally did it. For sure. Same here. Thanks for joining me, Lemmy. Uh, I mean, this was your idea. You were like, hey, want to do this with me? And I was like, sure, that sounds great. Uh, Enemy in Shadows is such a good book uh, where they took the, it's really, they say it's the first two adventures of the, the campaign, um, which was The Enemy Within and Shadows Over Bogenhofen, and, and put it into one book, uh, which works out perfectly. Uh, great stuff here. So we're going to be talking about like tips and tricks uh, to be running this um, as the GM. So if you're playing in The Enemy Within, uh, come back to this after you've finished this part of the of the campaign because we're definitely it's going to be f full of spoilers <laughs> yeah i've already warned the players in in my campaign not to watch today's stream for that reason <laughs> and really any spectator of our show to be honest but i'm sure it will be appealing for some gms um thinking of of wandering into this awesome campaign yeah so have you so you're running it now have you run it um before yeah, I ran it when back when Broadcastle was actually a games bar. <laughs> I ran it for, for people who came weekly sometimes or bi-weekly to play role-playing games. I think I ran it three times back then. Uh, then I started running it in the Start Playing platform for paid GMs. Uh, I have two parties which who are playing who are playing the campaign bi-weekly. And of course, I'm setting everything up uh, to run it for for my my show's party. They're right now. Uh, they finished the starter set. They're doing rough night and rough nights and hard days, mm. and it's all setting up for them to jump into the enemy within. Very cool. I hear a lot of people start that way with the the starter set and do rough nights, hard days, or some adventures in Uber's Reich, and then move into Enemy in Shadows. Uh, where, you know, my experience is a little bit different, where we just started with Enemy in Shadows, because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, let's play this campaign. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the rest is history on Gapapa there. So, uh, sounds like you have a lot more experience with this. And you, you're right now in book two, right? Or have yeah. you already finished Death on the Reich? We are nearing the end of Death on the Reich, uh, in terms okay. of, like, what's come out. What, what we've recorded is a little closer to the end of Death on the Reich. <laughs> The last I heard, I believe, the last time I, I, I watched one of one of your episodes, you were um, passing through the the signal tower, and two dwarves wanted to to hitchhike on the boat. Yep. Oh yeah. There's a lot of good stuff that starts with that uh, encounter. <laughs> About what you were saying earlier, the uh, the order that some people have picked to play all the material released by Cubicle Seven. It has to do with the order of the releases. We first had the starter set that was, I think it was that, and the rewriting of Night of, Night of Blood. Mm. Uh, well, it was all we had at, uh, at the beginning. Then Rough Nights and Hard Days came out, and it, all, it was only after that that the enemy within was released. Right. So yeah, yep. it's only natural 
That makes a lot of sense. And they have made, uh, they have created ways to connect these books. Uh, you'll always find hooks in order to jump either from the starter set to Enemy Within or perhaps the Uber Strike Adventure, which are awesome, by the way. Yeah. Everyone should play it. But that could be another episode. Let's dive really? into the Enemy Within. What we will do, we'll uh, go over the book just in the order that it's presented in the release and we'll uh, make commentaries and also try to remember what the parties we ran the campaign for did in each particular stage. Mm -hmm. So what do you say we just jump into it? Sounds good. Uh, so my first thing was that if you're planning on playing this campaign with a group of friends or whoever, I think it's really important to set up a mutual understanding for the campaign. This is not a sandbox campaign. I don't think it, it's a little railroady in some places, uh, but it kind of expects the players to jump onto certain clues and follow them. So if you've got a group that just wants to do whatever in the old world, the enemy within might not be for that group. Um, but as long as you make sure that that is set up in the beginning to say you're going to need to buy into some of these plot points and if it's you know if you feel like it's an obvious clue follow it because otherwise it's going to be a lot more work for the gm to make stuff up <laughs> as they go that's correct yeah uh i would also recommend if you're uh, thinking of diving into the enemy within and gm it uh now that everything has been released from book one to book five try to read all the books before running it that's like the 100 percent perfect scenario i know that it's kind of ambitious because that's a lot of material to read yeah but i don't know at least go ahead and and read the each chapter has a small um it's like a, what would you call it uh, the summary. adventure summary yeah, yeah. The adventure summary at least go over those um, and if you don't know if you want to to purchase the the book the hard uh, cover book all at once all the five books or ten if you're jump if you're going for companions uh, sure. the pdfs are much cheaper so you get that mm -hmm. yeah and if you don't feel like if you're going to run this and you're like oh, i don't have time to read five huge books I would recommend, obviously, read all of Enemy and Shadows first, and then, um, like you said, the, the summary of each of the other books, but definitely read the first bit of Empire and Ruins. There's a lot there that I kind of wish was in Enemy and Shadows to give you more an idea of what's what's going on, what's coming with the whole thing, because uh, a lot of things come back, which I think is a, a big strength of the campaign. I'll be honest, though. Um, the main reason I... I offered you to make these these videos was because I would have loved someone to tell me more or less what to be careful about if I don't want to read the five books uh, after, uh, before before GMing. Yeah, because for instance, I can tell you, don't get this character killed. You will need him later, and you wouldn't right. know that if you hadn't read read it. Yeah, and so if I you think don't want to read all that's... five books, just watch these videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll have to read them eventually, but at least you won't um, ruin the campaign for yourself, which I may have done in a couple of, of a couple of times. And that's the perfect segue to to jump in into the first um, scene that the campaign offers us. I haven't played the previous editions. I know that there was a module called the Olden Hall Hallen Olden Haller Contract or something like that, oh, which yeah. was a good way to jump into the enemy within or so i read uh so I, i'll always tell you the fourth edition uh, perspective because that's the edition the only edition i have played okay so uh the book kind of assumes that the party already knows each other and are traveling and stopping at a crossroads in the was it the coach and the horses right coach and horses yep there's a couple of things to to have in mind where when you're running that scene, but in my opinion, the most important is not to be tempted about the crow. The crow. I know I made the crow become a, a demon, for example, a horror of scenage, just to spice things up from the beginning. But Black that ended. There. <laughs> yeah, 
there is a, some sort of suggestion, if I'm not mistaken, that he is not what what it seems. Hmm. Isn't there even there a profile for a horror? Yeah, there's a profile for a horror. Oh, I think one of the grognard boxes, which is a, an important thing to mention there, where they, because this is a, a rewrite of a 30 plus year old campaign, they throw in these grognard boxes. Like if you've run this before, if you've have players that have played in this before, here are some ideas that you can change things to keep them on their toes so they don't know exactly what's coming all the time. Uh, and I think they're cool. I haven't made use of them much because, of course, this is the first time we've done it, but I, I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of mixed the grognard go boxes from the get-go, even if my parties were all people that have never had never played this this campaign. Because some of the things that they offer are really amazing. They're always in the tone of, oh, they were expecting these? Well, actually. <laughs> okay, and, Do this and instead. besides the crow, which, again, don't be tempted to turn him into a, a big thing. Sometimes <laughs> subject to his better. Uh, make sure they don't kill the physician student. Just make sure he's alive. right. Just yeah, he should be okay. Twice, I had my my players kill him in this what? first scene. Yeah, yeah, things can get can get wild in the taverns in the empire, and yeah, you will need him later in the beginning of not the beginning, but the beginning of the main part of Death on the Right, and, right. and that's where the second reason uh, for why I asked you to do this with me, Dan, is because I feel like this campaign bottlenecks in at some point. There's particular points in the story where there is only one hook that will lead the party to the next stage of the story. Yep. And if they miss it or it get, gets ruined or the derail that the party has taken uh, brings them really far from that hook, it can really ruin it for you and you'll have end up having to use one shots or stories from Uber Strike Adventures or, or even uh, homebrew stories for, from other uh, members of the community just to get them back on track. And if the trip is too long, I don't know, it's, there's some sort of momentum that is lost. Right, but they can literally lose the plot. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they become disinterested, you know? You really, really don't want that. Okay, what, what else can we say about the, the horse, the, um, this inn? I say just the make coach sure, and the horses. you know, get those initial NPCs that they meet here that they can be traveling with for a little, for a few days, um, are, are great to start developing characters. It's, I, in my experience, the first couple of sessions of a game, nobody knows their character at all. Even if you have a session zero and come up with some ideas, some people might have some outlandish things that there might pop up in their character. But having all these different characters they can meet from nobles to a uh, gambler uh, and, and Ernst himself, all those other people can really bring out things in the characters and get them get them role playing. So making sure that you know those characters well from the beginning and and play them so the so your players like them as well. That's correct. Yeah. Um I kind of fell in love with Philippe Descartes. He's, oh God, a, he's a, a really good character <laughs> and I I I don't I really don't know if he pops up later on. I don't remember. There's not he anything like official for him. Um, if you listen to Gapapa, you find out I, I bring him back later, mostly just for funsies. Yeah. And they're in, I think it's the Power Behind the Throne Companion has a spot where like there's a, like a chapter about bringing those people back potentially. Like how can you fit these people back in the campaign? Yeah. Uh, since he's traveling and he's a card player, um, I don't mind him popping up in different corners of the Empire now and then, because right. he's always on the move. So I've made him make cameos in some one-shots that I sometimes uh, run for for 
uh, either for tabletop parties or, or in my show. Nice. He's a, he's a really nice character for that. And the players, you most uh, almost all of the times you'll have a couple of them that will love him and a couple of them that will hate him. Yeah. I think and think that's the case in in Gapopa, isn't it? Oh yeah, he was just fun to play as like this kind of smarmy dude. Uh, so lucky the the witch in the party really liked him because he was like learning to play cards from him. And but he was hitting on Mina the soldier, uh, which was really fun to do because you know her player Danny is my wife. So she was just kind of like, "Stop being a creep," and I'm like, "I'm not. I'm playing a character." <laughs> so that's super fun to just you know ham it up with these people, especially Philippe, because that's his whole thing. Okay, and then uh, things to have in mind uh, when you're leaving this this inn. I know you mentioned one to me earlier today. Is that things make sure to, to... You spoke about the the pact that has to be made with the players before entering into this campaign. Like you mentioned, uh, making sure everyone understands that this is not a sandbox, and I I I don't know, like having that in mind in order to to progress through the story. But you also mentioned that uh, if among your characters you only have a handful of pennies, you could be stuck. <laughs> in this very first moment of the campaign right because they, the yeah go ahead i said they assume that you've been kind of waylaid you were on a coach and you've lost it for whatever reason which fit in our campaign perfectly having a coachman in the party which has set up all kinds of stuff later on but then they they write it as if they assume that the party will buy passage on this other coach at this inn and it's like eight silver per person or something crazy which almost no starting character will have and I've seen a lot of people complain about this, but I like that it forces the players to be more creative and find something to do. So, spoiler from Gapapa, they decide to just steal the coach instead of buy passage because I guess why wouldn't you? And <laughs> that, it's kind of their thinking. And it's weird how it's uh, laid out too because you first need 100% to, to pay for this coach and later on the, the the campaign suggests that you steal it once they become drunk. So you fit the, I mean, the, the riders, not the riders, the drivers, the coachmen. Yeah, Gunner and Holtz. Gunner and Holtz. Yeah, they they pursued the Gipopa party up to Bogenhafen, did you? Didn't they? Weren't they? Yeah, a uh, little spoiler, they show up again later as well. Okay. They They become a thorn in the side of the party. Uh, and it like I said, it worked out so well that we had a coachman in the party, so he just kind of took over, and was they just convinced everybody that they got new drivers. So all the other NPCs were like, I mean, okay, I guess we'll just keep going. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there was they do a nice job with all these NPCs at the beginning without being too much, because you don't want to throw like 10, 15 people at your players starting this campaign that don't even know really the other PCs yet. But I think this was a kind of a sweet spot here, and you get to know some of these characters and travel with them a few days, and you know potentially make some enemies. Yeah, and it's also cool that they give you a, a little taste of what dealing with nobility is like with the noble lady that's traveling with with Philippe. Oh yeah, oh she's super fun to play too because you can be totally you know looking looking down her nose at the party and everything and just being like oh yeah <laughs> yeah because uh, this is definitely a campaign where you interact with nobles a lot so that's another thing to have in mind when when creating the party if you're all uh, brass statues and don't have any chances of of leaving that that status as you level up. You'll have a hard time at some points. I mean, it's it's not just the beginning where you meet this this girl. I think uh, when you go to Aldorf, you don't interact. Oh yeah, you interact with. Okay, let's let's just move on, and we'll get there. <laughs> well, yeah. So bringing up Aldorf, that's another really important part of setting up the campaign with your players is making sure the characters have a reason to be going to Altdorf from the beginning, but making it not so important that they don't want to leave Altdorf because it's real easy for people to assume, oh, we're going to Altdorf, so the campaign is taking place there, and then you'll have to get them to realize pretty quick, no, it's just a stopping point. 
where we mean to go. Yeah, this is especially something to be careful about if you're playing with people who are also new to the setting, because after all, you're making them arrive to the capital city of the most important faction in the setting, and they are, they, I mean, the only the, the natural decision that they will make is to stay there, because suppose allegedly it has so much to offer you as a gm and especially when enemy within was sorry enemy when in shadows was released don't have a lot of resources to to know what's going on in aldorf uh aldorf crown of the empire which is the source book for the city only came out i, I dare say a year a year and a half after uh, the first installment of the campaign so yeah, it was quite a while before that you didn't have anything to hold on to they barely described the the city of a hundred taverns and a couple of things more but let's face it there's a lot of careers that all, their only way to progress is to be in contact with other members of that career and in Aldorf, everyone's represented so there's a hundred percent chance that each of your players will find something for their character to do i was just right. telling dan in an example that if you have a priest of sigmar for instance he will want to go to the to the high temple of sigmar in in Aldorf. it's like the big cathedral for the for the whole religion uh the same goes for magic students and wizards or for academics i don't know almost any city career has something to do here in 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 Aldorf. So, in my opinion, it is a lot easier for you if you own the Aldorf Crown of the Empire book to run this part of the campaign and also the other moments in the campaign where they visit Aldorf. But it's not like mandatory. It will give you a nicer map because the map of Aldorf that comes with the enemy in shadows is, is really lacking. It's like, yeah, it's serviceable. Yeah. <laughs> And the one in Aldorf Crown of the Empire, which they also sell as a as a poster, uh, it's really nice. And yeah, those are real good. I don't know if you have checked the Foundry version already, but having all the journals for the different points in the city they can visit is is awesome. Oh yeah, having Foundry for this is huge. Uh, but I would say the Aldorf book isn't wouldn't be totally necessary for the campaign yet if you once you get to empire and ruins you're definitely going to want to uh have read through that and have a really good idea of the city because you spend a lot more time in altdorf then but you pass through it a few times on this adventure yeah you're always going through altdorf and saying no we're not staying here for long uh in some cases you probably could stay a little while maybe do an endeavor or something but for especially the first couple books it's more like all right, we're we're here for an intersection on a river and going a different way. Yeah, and also let's remember that parties tend to be more um, uh, tend to misbehave a lot more when they start sometimes, and you don't want them to be banned from Aldorf just in the beginning. That will no. bring problems in the rest of the campaign. Okay, let's <laughs> let's move. Oh, uh, we were saying. If you want to skip Aldorf, you can totally do that and it won't have major repercussions for the campaign. There, oh, yeah. they, they meet Joseph right there, right? Them. Yeah. That's the only thing that happens. Yeah, they meet Joseph, who they could meet in any of the, those inns that are where the roads of the Empire meet the river and they build the, the inn with a little wharf and it has a lot of traffic. Absolutely. Yeah, they could meet Joseph in one of those. Or Joseph, perhaps you want to turn him into a, a coach driver. I don't know. There's... You can even reframe the very beginning a little bit and have people already going to Bogenhofen instead of Altdorf and just skip that entirely if you don't want to deal with going to the biggest city in the old world. Like, I don't think that's a problem at all. The only problem I see is that you would start using this book on page 50. So you would <laughs> half of your money would almost be thrown to the garbage. But yeah, uh, you can skip all those. Bear in mind that on the way to Wies uh, Wiesbrook and then Bogenhafen, a lot of adventures can be had, and it's worth taking a look over the the different modules that 
have been released either in one shots of the Rakeland or for example I think Death on the Reich has a couple of, of modules at the, on the companion that can be used while you travel and even the enemy the enemy shadows companion has a couple oh yeah i love that for the the companions always seem to have a couple little things that you could throw in and the enemy within or you could throw in any any game really and i really like how they did that anyways if if everything goes well uh one of your play one of your party's characters is uh castor liberum lookalike and you are headed to Bogenhafen to get an inheritance that, that is enough money for someone to retire, I believe. Oh, yeah. 20,000 gold is a crazy amount of money, which I could definitely see some parties being like, that's not, no, that's too much money. That can't be real. Uh, and, and that's where it was talking about, like, setting it up with your, with your players to say, like, you got to buy into some of these things. Otherwise, it's not going to go anywhere. So, yeah. like, they, they have to be ready to for their character to be like, "Oh my god, twenty thousand gold, I'm in." And that's also the, that's the same reason why you have to hype up the Schaffenfest from the beginning, because you want them to visit the Schaffenfest again. They are arriving to a big commercial city in the Empire. They may want to do anything, and you want them to go to the Schaffenfest specifically. So you have all the road from Aldorf to here to hype up the Schaffenfest, either by rumors, by talking to uh, Joseph about it, by watching people flock towards Bogenhafen, by food, by cart, by by ship. There's, I believe there's a moment here where it says, and sometimes the canals get so jammed that people start shouting at, at each other from one barge to the other one to, to make way. You, you really have to hype up the the importance of the Schaffenfest in this province. For sure, yeah, because, again, if they don't go and, and experience things there, the plot kind of stalls out. Luckily, with my party, they had their first taste of having some money working for Joseph on the boat on the way to Bogenhofen. They made some silver, and they were, like, all ready to go spend it at the Schaffenfest. They were like, let's go have some fun. <laughs> yeah. Of course, on the way there, they were also attacked by a bounty hunter and all that that they were like, okay, we barely survived. Let's go spend some money and have some fun. The, I, probably the first thing they will want to do is to go and try and, and get the inheritance because that's the main reason they're in the city. You'd uh, think. <laughs> yeah, you'd think. <laughs> but anything can happen. I would suggest that if they want to go shopping, just make the shops be in the Schaffenfest. I mean, if you're a local, and there's a big festival just outside the walls of your town. Why would you keep your shop in the shop in the not shopping district in the traders district? I guess in the artisans district, open. Yeah, go set if, up a tent. Yeah, if the if all the traffic is outside, go set up a stall and make it like. I don't know. There's a, a lot of things that you can move from the city to the Schaffenfest. Even the book says that the court is the. Is it the court? Yeah, the court is moved yeah, to the, the Schaffenfest and have um, abbreviated uh, trials there. So everything revolves around the Schaffenfest. Make sure that you are careful about that. And I put in my note too, to let your characters enjoy the Schaffenfest for a bit because things turn dark really quick in Bogenhofen. Let them have their, their time in the sun and actually have some fun before you know people's hearts starting to get ripped out yeah <laughs> um let me see my notes okay and and in the Schaffenfeld, it, it's pretty straightforward you have a set of um events that happen some of them don't need to happen in a strict order but there's a couple key scenes that need to happen which are the runaway goblin after they visit Dr. Malthusius, which is really um, attractive, an attractive show in, in the Schaffenfest, so they will definitely visit it. Uh, you could, in any case, if they decide not to spend the money, just make the goblin run away and, and have the party see him outside. That's not too hard. But the drunken dwarf, 
I think uh, deserves a little more attention because a lot of interesting things can be do can be done uh, with this character. It's the only connection we have to dwarves. Correct yeah, me if I'm wrong. Book. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in the whole book. So if anything wants to be done around dwarves, he's the key to it. For instance, one of my parties uh, wanted to buy some things that were, I think, availability was scarce in the rule book or something like that. And we rolled and the role said that, yeah, it was available. But that would be only on, that would be something I don't know a fine helmet or something like that. Only something that a, a very skilled artisan could do, could do. So I just put a dwarf there. And now when Godfrey died, there was a family mourning him because it was his cousin, and the Morian Guild wanted to take him and 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 bring him to the cemetery to, for a Morian priest to give him the last rites. And now you have a dwarf that says, "No, I want to intern my cousin." Uh, by the dwarf uh, ways and take him back to the hold or something and you create small conflict that is uh, very useful to fill some gaps sometimes I like that a lot yeah Our, luckily my party connected with him um mostly because lucky in the party one of his ambitions or his ambition is to help the downtrodden so he saw this you know luckless dwarf here that is in the stocks just for being drunk and like tried to give him some bread and whatnot. So they really connected with him. So finding his body later was, uh, they were not fans of that. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm seeing the only other dwarf is um, Dr. Malthusius' assistant, but they are not related. Rooney. Yeah. And they're not, not the best representations of dwarves either. Like this drunken vagrant and this guy that, you know, his job is to poke and prod animals, essentially, at least how he does it. And th these are the only doors we see in this whole book, and they're they're not stellar examples of their people. No, <laughs> and neither are those in Death on the Reichs. Death on the Reich, but okay. Not really, no. <laughs> because they're Imperial Dwarves. Imperial Dwarves are different. For sure. Uh, yeah, one thing gonna... I... I wouldn't like to miss about the Schaffenfest and to mention is Elvira. Elvira yes. is crucial to the to the adventure. In the first chapters of Death on the Reich, we'll need her alive. And the way the timeline is created, I always recommend that Elvira leaves the Schaffenfest one day earlier, at least. Sense. The only people that want to stick in the Schaffenfest until the last day are cattle traders, because that's the day where uh, there's a tax exempt exemption. The, all the other business people can can leave earlier, and it, it only makes sense. After all, Vira has a small child while waiting for her in Wisbrook, and she wouldn't right, we want find to... find out later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Have you ever had a party buy some sheep when there are no taxes on that day? Well, yeah, the one that uh, there was a time that I totally, fully Grognar run uh, the enemy within, enemy shadow, sorry. So I used old Grognar boxes and yeah. um, Tugan was a vampire and Joseph was in league with them. So Joseph? They, yeah, so they killed oh, Joseph and kept, kept his barge. And oh. the party is not supposed to have a barge so early. So they had an empty barge and they were in the Schaffenfest and they bought a shitload of ship and, and got them into the ship. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> now our party talked about buying some sheep. They thought they may have been able to afford it at the time and then uh, forgot slash kind of had, you know, got run out of town essentially. Wasn't there uh, something with sheep in uh, Gopopa where some uh, herders would put uh, undergarments on them. Was that Kipopa or? or oh, the I... lewd zoo. Yeah, the lewd zoo. <laughs> Carl didn't want to go to Dr. Malthusius's because he thought it was a lewd zoo because none of the animals were wearing any clothes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, so I knew I remembered that. something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh, what else about the Shuffin' Fist then? Um, one way or another, our char the characters are stuck with the mission of finding this goblin. And they will probably take this job because they just lost 
twenty thousand gold pieces. So they're probably right, dangling that little bit of money in front of them this early in the campaign is is a huge motivator. Where what would they offer them five gold? Right, that's a ton of money to a handful of people. Like, how much can they get with you know five gold? And all we do is find some stupid three legged goblin. No problem. Unless they are nobles, they probably never had any gold in their hands ever. Absolutely. Let's remember that uh, there are three major um, like social statuses in Warhammer, and there is gold, there is silver, and there is brass. And that's the currency they use inside of each class. If you are from a brass class, you will probably deal in pennies. And if you are from a silver class, you will probably deal in silver and some pennies and maybe now and then a gold. And if you're a gold class, you will mostly deal with royal crowns. And that's how it is. So yeah, <laughs> even it shining in front of their eyes is already tempting. Um, so yeah, they're stuck in the in the sewers. There's a lot you can do in the sewers. This is a great moment to decide whether you want to be uh, where in the gritty scale you want to be because yeah, <laughs> they can catch diseases. Diseases take time to incubate. Then the symptoms last for another set amount of times. So you have to keep track of all of this stuff. I mean, if you're able to deal with the encumbrance and you have no problem, I'd say go for it. Else, try to try to make it more simple in some way. I don't know. For instance, one of my parties, there's a player that sometimes misses the session. It's not never the same players. Just one of them misses the session. Oh, yeah. And them having been incubating these diseases allows me to say, well, he's got the shits, so he will be stuck at the tavern for a whole session. Things like that. We had a campaign like that back when I was doing second edition. We were playing Terror and Talibheim. And I don't know where it came up with, but we had people that wouldn't be able to make it. So one of the players made up that they would get a disease called goiter bait. And they would just be out of commission for the day or two or whatever the session lasted. And it was just yeah. the most ridiculous name, and I loved it. As long as you we have a, a, a base of operations, uh, it's always possible it's it's weird when you're having a campaign where they are i don't know traveling through the mountains and okay where's billy i don't know he was here yesterday yeah it's easier to explain if you're in the city yes way back my first like homebrew campaign I ever ran when second edition was really new we used to say that if somebody wasn't there they were in the ogre's pocket okay <laughs> just just as a, a half a joke uh because i let somebody play one of the like uh fan made ogre class their career uh species that's the word so it was like oh they're not here today they're in the ogre's pocket because we had like 12 people in the game and like you know six people would show up typically so it was always a mishmash i still haven't had anyone in one of my parties be an ogre i wonder how this campaign can turn if there's an ogre in the party i mean all the thugs that are thrown at the party at the different stages of the investigations are kind of worthless if there's an ogre, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I've told the players that if any, but you know, if we have to replace a character, we're we're not rolling on the table with an ogre. <laughs> I just don't. I love the idea of being able to play an ogre in the game. I don't think they fit in the enemy within. Yeah, I think it would make it very like any like you said, any fight would be great fun for the ogre player they'd just be wrecking everything but everybody else would be like why am i here and then the ogre wouldn't be able to interact with much of the the rp stuff you know what would be fun though an all ogre party <laughs> yes <laughs> none of them knowing how to read oh did we mention that have someone oh, yeah, that knows huge... how to read Super important. I, I did like how we had nobody that could read until Death on the Reich. And it was kind of a pain, but it also worked out well that it kind of forced people to interact with NPCs they may not have interacted with before that were like, hey, can you read this for me? And sometimes they were like, yeah, give me a penny and I'll do it kind of thing. <laughs> and yeah, other yeah. times it was, and they had to be careful who they had read what because there was some really sensitive information where it's like, oh, you're inheriting $20,000? What's your name again? Where are you going? How can I get this from you? 
Yeah, not, not only that, on, but later on when really, there's some letters that you have to pay attention to. And not That are like campaign breaking if they miss them. Yeah. So, like way almost too important. We'll get there just in a second. Uh, okay, so you go to the sewers. I don't know if there's uh, anything else to to delve into here in, in the sewer part. I mean, there's the the reunion or the meeting with Franz Baumann. Bear in mind that having the crooked fingers, that's the Renaldian cult in Bogenhafen, the crooked fingers in your pocket during the campaign can uh, speed some things up and turn some things the other way. Because if, I mean, it's always handy to have contacts in the underworld and it will speed things up. Yep. But let's remember that even with parties like Gupopa, for example, where there are all kind of misfits in uh, except for for Carl, uh, you need a sense of honor, of uh, doing what's right, even if it's twisted, because there will be some points in the campaign where the characters will only drive onwards if they feel like they really need to see what's up with these cults of chaos uh, and bring them to an end and stopping rituals. If they don't give a shit and they start living a criminal life where there's, I'm sure, a lot of interesting things to do, they won't be interested in following the, the hooks in the campaign. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and that's part of that, like, kind of almost social contract when running this game where it's like, yes, you you could do whatever you want, but you should probably, you know, try not to derail things completely. <laughs> we could play a different game if you want to, you know, be, be part of the criminal underworld and start your own gang. Yeah. And the thing is that um, you could do that if you wanted. Uh, Bogenhafen, even if it is the least fleshed out sandbox that Cubicle 7 has released yet. Um, it is a sandbox because uh, more or less the last third part of the book, it's all descriptions about different buildings and the people in them and a couple of adventures hooks for each NPC that's mentioned. And then you have the NPCs in the companion too. So if you wanted to use uh, the Enemy in Shadows book as a Bogenhafen sandbox, sandbox sorry, just as the one that there is in the starter set for Ubersreg, you could. It's totally possible. It will require yeah, more study from you. Yeah, for sure. And I would say as another like tip, like make sure you know Bogenhofen well. Um, make sure, especially like the merchant families and their relationships and all that. Uh, understanding what's going on in the city besides just the grand plot is. is will make bring it to life more and have the pcs care more about what's happening if you have a better idea of what's going on in the city i think and the the like you know like you said the third uh, last third of the book it's like 50 pages all about the city is is well done it's nice you really get to know bogenhofen well and it's important to really bring that city to life for the players yeah uh I don't know if the campaign is too broken if they stay in Bogenhafen after finishing this book and using the sandbox a lot, a uh, bit. Uh, but it may become kind of stale, as in the urgency of finding out who Etel Kaherson is may be diluted, I believe. So either use it as a sandbox or don't. Mixing it can be um, worse, I believe. I could see that because the adventure is written to basically once you go through the the sewers with the goblin and and find those first clues, you got like three days to figure stuff out, and the the players can run out of clues relatively quickly and get a little discouraged. Where I know as we were going through, we had people in the in that were playing the game were saying, "I don't know what to do now. Like I feel lost because I feel like we've kind of uncovered everything that we can with what." we've gotten so far and i had to tell them like you, you're so close but there are other events that will happen that will trigger that will give you more clues as well so making sure that the players understand that yeah you, you have certain number of clues to help you figure out what exactly is going on you might exhaust them relatively quickly but kind of keep going keep going like because if they're just like all right well i don't know we can't figure it out i guess we're out of here 
you know, then you got greater demons showing up. Yeah, which happens once, happened in one of my runs. And it's pretty awesome oh, really? because then you can activate uh, a, a, a whole province responding to a military urgency and supernatural in nature. And that's amazing because you'll have armies marching through the roads, uh, part of the Imperial Navy sailing up to Bogenhafen to, to deal with the menace. I mean, we're talking hundreds of demons coming out of a portal. But yeah, we're kind of... incursion. Yeah. Uh, I would say dur yeah, go ahead. the thing was going to say... Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, uh, during that time, those three days, there's that like half a page box out that... Uh, was huge in like framing our campaign for this time, We're talking about more sleb and how it increases throughout those three days until it's like huge in the sky during the day, staring down at you, causing mutations and everything. And it's just such a good source of tension that I feel it could easily be missed because it's just a little box out. Yeah, page uh, eighty-five. Sure... What's that? Page eighty-five. The Bad Moon 85. Rising. Yeah, and, and it's huge. And it, for for our playthrough, it was instrumental in really you know, ratcheting up that tension and getting the players to really feel like something, you know, the world is still happening around them kind of thing. And it was a reason for them to leave Bogenhofen when it was over. Where it was like, well, we don't want to be around with that moon anymore. Yeah, at least... Even though it had gone away by then. <laughs> go out only in the day. No, I, I have parties run out of time i have i've had parties come to warehouse uh, 13 ahead of time i never ever had any party that made it just in time like like the timeline developed as the game designers intended i have these right. bookmarks that i made uh, i don't know if the camera will take it there's are magnetic bookmarks with okay. the characters in my party and i use them to mark the different parts of the book uh, that are important during a session and i always have page 85 that's why i told you uh, by memory yeah the bad moon rising because i use it as a clock it's like a natural clock the only thing that really changes during these days is how the moon is behaving in the sky some events can be uh, postponed some some events can happen earlier but the best guide you have over those three or four days depending on how you set it up that they have before the ritual the best way to to have a guide and help you is to look at this and well day one i know the the, the moon appears full but they don't yet have to roll for uh, endurance and such because it's not a, a corruption exposure and and yeah it, it it will also tell them that like something something imminent something is happening soon and it can Absolutely. kind of puts pressure on them it's really useful yeah. yeah i totally agree and in in our playthrough i ended up kind of speeding things up a bit because i felt like they had hit all the major stuff and it was you know if we had totally followed it they would have had one more day to explore bogenhofen but there wasn't much else for them to do, so I just had some events trigger sooner, and and keep that tension way up and everything, and that and, you know, ended up being some real tense, nail biting times for them. And it, I thought it went well, and it was really fun to play. <laughs> I just suggest that you use the the moon as if it were an NPC in itself. Absolutely, and that's why I, I picked the this this picture for the stream. <laughs> Because I think it's a pivotal piece of scenery. Uh, well, okay, le finishing the sewers. There's one, the first probably bottleneck of the campaign is here. Because uh, depending on how well they do with a perception check or intuition, I don't remember which it was, they can find or may not find a handkerchief with the initials of in Franz Steinhager. And right, also and be able to huge. open the, 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 there's like an armoire there with a ceremonial dagger, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and like a silver platter or something. And then again, being able to read comes up again, if they don't know what those letters are. they Because in our game, they had to go find somebody to read it for them. And they were like, oh yeah, this says FS. And they're like, 
Okay, what does that mean? Fucking shit. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I don't know why the writers decided to have the demon give them a chance to, to avoid the encounter. Because, I mean, you're playing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and a demon appears in front of you. You surely won't negotiate. You either run or smash it down. I don't know. What right. do you think? Yeah, I don't... I can't even remember if I... I had to talk to him a little bit, but it was certainly... In that party, it was definitely fight or flight kind of thing that was like let's get out of here well mina was like i'm gonna get out of here this is this is insane and the others are uh, i think a couple of them failed their fear check so they couldn't even leave the room at first so it was they all had to kind of rally once they realized that not everybody was leaving right away but it does seem weird that it would like parlay at all i'd say give them a chance to enter the room if there's no one with uh the correct skills to open the lock or a spell just make it so that there's one solution that will let them come in because it's really hard for him for them if they don't have the clues that are inside this room and i think just the demon itself is really galvanizing where they're like oh there's some really serious stuff going on we need to take care of this because now there are demons in the sewers like everybody in the empire knows demons are, are real things that can happen and is never good yeah. so it's like oh I, we even if so if you have a party that's not as motivated to uncover this plot hopefully finding a demon in the sewers will will get them going and kind of be that dynamite underneath them to say oh no we got to solve this problem it's always good to have someone uh, be from Bogenhafen in the party uh, it can be someone that left some years ago, so he, he or she may not know all the, the the things that are happening right now in the city, which would kind of ruin it. But it's good because there's some things about having uh, lore, uh, Bogenhafen, that can come handy in the campaign. For instance, Bogenhafen, I think it was 100 or 200 years ago, was raised by demons because a rift very similar to the one that the Order of Centenarius wants to open opened uh, in the city and a lot of demons came out and only one person survived the, the city was completely devastated one? it's there is in that the, a Drakenfels thing? yeah something happened in Drakenfels and rifts started opening all over the Borbergland I hope I didn't butcher that and I think the farther one went to Bogenhafen and the only person that survived was uh, some von dragon it's a character that's on the last part of the book it's a weird man bird thing have you seen it oh that guy yeah i didn't actually read his whole story he's he's a survivor yeah he's a survivor, he's survivor from the, that? yeah he he was the only survivor and he was found roaming the streets totally demented because of the horrors he had seen is oh wow called magus Bolker. Drochen from the cult of the vigilant eye and i use this guy i try to cool. use him in every run even if it's only part of the sandbox information because oh, wow. it's very I, interesting i stayed away from him because just he's crazy powerful and the pcs at this point would like he's he's a super dangerous opponent he's but do you know what i did i made him really think that Castor Livern was Castor Livern. So instead of being from the Vigilant Tie, I made him a very old member of the Purple Hand, who may be disconnected with, with the rest of the cult, but knows the most important heads in the cults. So he would know Castor from before, and he would interact with the players as if uh, Castor was Castor. And it's really interesting because he won't, he won't threaten them, because he believes them to be allies, but he wants to see the the Order of Septenarius go down because he doesn't want any other Zenichian cults uh, in his city or uh, even a, a Red Crown cult. Because after all, the Order of Septenarius is working the designs of Red Crown cultists like Etelka Herson, who provides the the scroll for the for the ritual, for example. 
they're more connected to the to the red crown than they are to the purple hand so it it, it would only make sense that the city had uh purple hand agents trying to uh, disrupt the order of plans and this one's perfect wow. and he's insanely overpowered yeah well yeah he's got like he's probably the most powerful magic user i've seen in any of the books so far and he's in the first book of the campaign where he's got a uh, language magic 138 yeah channeling dark 140 right like yeah he rolled an 80 and still got six success levels <laughs> oh my gosh and he's got instinctive diction does that say five yeah you really have Eight. to set it up so the characters are afraid of him and go on uh, like how do you say it in english roll with his story yeah something like that uh so what i do is i i make him be the the witch hunter that's hanging with lord once upon a time and since he's a mage of sinich of course he can change his his looks so he appears oh, like as that. a human and he presents himself as a as a renegade uh witch hunter as a rogue witch hunter Huh. And then when he confirms that it's Caster, and when they are in uh, close quarters, he reveals to the party, as he actually looks like half bird, half person, and it's really shocking for them. And they never tried to attack him in the past. I mean, you just have to make sure that they know this, that if they attack him, they will probably all die. Yeah, that would not, not be a good move. <laughs> Just imagine him casting dart one time. Yeah. Addiction, like he'd hit all of them for like ton, so much damage. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, his willpower has... is 110, so he's he's dealing an extra 11 damage with any magic missiles, on top of his crazy amount of success levels. Like he could one shot a party with a single dart easily. Yeah, that's true. Unless unless you have a dwarf. Yeah. Right somebody with any amount of armor they'll be okay but yeah you definitely oh, i like this guy as like i almost could see him showing up at the end instead of sure or get true yeah or or if if the lord of change comes out of the portal he could face the lord of change easily oh there you go he saves bogenhofen yeah <laughs> well, one of his trappings says the fate of bogenhofen so <laughs> well uh, the lore that's laid out about him has him be some sort of weird protector of bogenhofen i mean he wants uh, bogenhofen to be a key agent in the in the end of times but he doesn't want this uh, like self uh, glorified merchants to do it because he was here first. It's an awesome character. Probably my favorite in all the NPCs in this book. Yeah, I wish I'd given him more time before. I just kind of looked at his stats and I was like, no, he's not going to be in my campaign anytime soon. And I just kind of didn't give him the time of day. And now I need to read over that more and see if I could try to include him later, maybe. He sounds awesome. Yeah, he does. Okay, so after the sewers, uh, things get a bit hazy. There's not a particular order in which things uh, will happen i mean you have a, a couple events that are timed for example the dinner at the house of the tugans where all the other members of the order of scenarios join to discuss the last uh, details of the ritual the night before that's one that you have to remember the ritual the day of the the last day of the Schaffenfest, and i don't think it, there's any other that's actually timed is it those are the two I things that think you have to bear in mind head. this is where it gets sandboxy within the city and you just try to steer them towards figuring it out before time is up yeah the ritual is in day four so the reunion is in day three in the at, at night and in that morning uh, magirius should have already uh, come forward to the characters, which means they will need to have met him the day before on day two. So the next thing you want to do is have them meet Magirius at day two, ideally. Things don't usually go ideally when you're GMing role-playing games, right. 
but bear that in mind. Um, no oh, and the, there's the madman in the square. The madman in the square also uh, doesn't shouldn't appear before uh, day two because he is kind of foreshadowing. Yeah, that was one my players didn't really bite on at all. I tried to ha I had him show up and you know say his stuff, and they were just kind of like, ah, he's crazy, and just kind of ignored him and kept going. So, you know, it's, even when you do give them the clues, they might just not realize it's a clue. But it's it's the first well, time that the Bloody Rose is mentioned. Perhaps they didn't actually, like, um, rationally or consciously get it, but the Rose was already planted for them, you know? Because right. that's where you start joining the dots. When you find out that, that Godfrey uh, was seen with two guards with a rose, a bloody rose livery, and then the madman starts speaking about bloody roses, you start joining the dots, and that incriminates the Tugans. I feel like that's one of those clues that would be easier to connect, like if you were playing on something like Foundry, and people had these potential images of things where that was something we did a, a bonus episode on patreon that i kind of went through the book and talked to them about like things they missed and stuff that wasn't spoiler for things later in the campaign and that was one that they were all everybody was like yeah i didn't i didn't catch on to that at all had no idea what was going on there we figured it was some kind of noble but definitely they never even met tugan yeah they can they can miss it until the ritual starts right Right. And then they're like, who's this guy? Um, yeah. And, and one thing that is barely mentioned here, I think it's a couple of paragraphs only, is if they visit the magistrate that gave them the, the bounty for the goblin later, they will find him uh, laying in bed sick. There's two things I want to point out about this. Uh, you can really, really start improvising with this character uh, if if the players need to to join some dots. What I usually do is, since he is not part of the Ordo Septenarius, even though he's connected with with all these people, I make him be the only one that socializes with the Rook Brother uh, Patriarch. The Rook Brother Patriarch is the only. A member of a major merchant family that doesn't belong to the Ordo Septenarius. And then you're just building antagonists that could help the party uh, and give them clues or a piece of information that they may need. And any any commoner can, I mean, since the Ordo Septenarius existence is known commonly for bog and half and pe the citizens, even though they know they don't know the, the actual nature of their meetings, they know it exists. And some of them may even know that Rook Brother doesn't belong to the Ordo. And even a fewer amount of them will maybe let you know that Rook Brother holds a grudge for not being in or thinking that they do nefarious things. So the characters may feel inclined in paying the old Rook Brother a visit. Which is also a nice base of operations if they really uh, get on well with him because uh, the lord says that he has sent his um his family to aldorf because he feels like some shit is going to happen in this in the city soon so the the, the you know, whole house out. is empty <laughs> and that's where reading the that the base you know the information about bogenhofen can really enhance your your campaign in the story here where you know that's not gone over as much in the main campaign part of the book you could make uh, rook brother be drowken in disguise <laughs> just fit that guy in everywhere yeah. yeah i was a little disappointed that the, my players didn't go back to talk to the judge at all mostly because i really liked playing him he was super fun and Potential clues, you know, they missed out on. I think he can steer them to Tugan more easily than other clues. Uh, but at that time, nobody had a heal, so, like, they weren't going to get as much because they weren't going to be able to help him out with his Zinch disease. Well, see, that's where I, where I try to introduce Elvira again. Because yeah. if this... Uh, the, the, the doctor says, after the, diagnose, the correct diagnosis has been made, 
The doctor says that, that the ingredients needed for the cure are not available in Bogenhafen. But let's remember that people from all over has come to the Schaffenfest, so some vendors may have the ingredients needed. And it's really handy for it to be uh, Vira, because we need the party to uh, start setting up a good term relationship with her, to be committed to her, like even emotionally. So later on, when we put him, put her, sorry, as bait, uh, or, or, or as a way to for the for the story to progress, they they are drawn to to helping her, and it's at least uh, a way for them to stop at Wisbrook at all when they're back in the beginning of Death on the Rack. Yeah. So I can't stress this enough. Give Elvira a lot of importance. You will thank if yourself any reason later. for them to go talk with her. Yes. And make sure they like her to some degree. <laughs> if the party doesn't have a healer and recurs to paying physicians uh, to heal themselves, uh, to heal them, l make them go to Elvira. She may not be a physician, but she can provide ointments and, and potions that will do the work just the same. And Absolutely. there's a, a, a one shot adventure in Uber's Rack Adventures 1, I believe, that's called Bait and the Witch which also involves a, a herbalist and apothecary. And in there, there's uh, she's, she's trying a new recipe and it's called Cordelia's Enhanced, Enhanced Tonic. And basically it's a, a healing potion that cures twice as much as the regular one, but has a small side effects table, which is really interesting. Make Elvira have that. Uh, players will be drawn by things that are not regularly available in the in the rule book. I like that idea a lot. And I got miss that adventure. I need to read through that one. That sounds great. Yeah, the trapping is even included in Foundry. You find it as as Cordelia's uh, experimental potion or something like that. Just search, search Cordelia. But if you use it, make sure you change the name to Elvirus. Like or if you're trying to mix things up. You can make Elvira be Cordelia if you have played the one shot before. There's nothing oh, yeah. players like more than stories intertwining because it gives them a sense of like the things they do really matter in the world. And I love the idea of showing that the world, you know, things are still happening in the world around them. It doesn't always completely revolve around the characters. And it's like, oh, this person happened to come over here for the Schaffenfest that you met before. Cool. Yeah, and I was just going over uh, A Day in the Trials, the second adventure in Rough Nights and Hard Days, which I run today. And there's a, a magistrate Richter in there too, but they're not the same Richter. They're probably <laughs> cousins or brothers. They're both both judges, one in Bogenhafen and one in Kempervad. Uh, you can work with that. You can create a crazy story of a family of Berena followers or something like that. Or you could even make it the same person because in that adventure he is kind of humiliated and may want to move to another city so the players can meet him again when they come back to Bogenhafen. And this guy again. Yeah. You know what, like how that. we helped you back then? Okay. But yeah, Magistri reached her. Uh, easily looked um easily forgotten and actually really important so pay a look at, 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 at that in the book uh, as i said that i tried the vampire bluff that grognar box that mentioned that's mentioned about tugan it's interesting not everyone likes the idea of vampires and and forces of chaos working together i think for some parts of the setting it doesn't fit too well for instance, I wouldn't have a, a chaos a cult in, be too big in Sylvania. But we are in yeah. the middle of the Raglands here, so the forces of evil may work together. If you do so, in any case, for uh, always remember that Gideon will be more powerful than Tugan, even if Tugan is a vampire. We're talking about uh, a, a demon of, of Sinich that probably is unique and, and has its own unique name. And he's supposed to be like a herald as well, which is a you know pretty powerful entity there. Yeah. 
He's he's that not a he's not a changeling though, no. 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 Because that one appears. He has shapeshifter ability. He has like the doppelganger spell and stuff, but he's not the changeling. There, I think there's a Grognar box that has about like making it the changeling instead. Yeah, of that's why I got I got mixed up. That would be even more powerful. <laughs> yeah. I I love Gideon as as the villain here. It was it was so much fun having him pop up as the kid skin that he wears and then popping up as the player characters and just messing with their heads and they're like, You see yourself but with one brown eye and one blue eye blue eye and they're like, It's that kid again <laughs> And they really they really hate him pretty quickly. Um and huge spoiler uh people that are if you're playing through this, um skip the next little bit. Uh, he comes back in Empire and Ruins and is hugely important again. And I love that because they're going to be so mad. Anybody that survives that long, if they see him pop up again, they're going to be like, this little shit is back. I'm going to burn him again. I just realized that you are a uh, spoiler warning for people who are seeing, watching this if they only played the enemy in shadows. I'm sorry if I spoiled yeah. anything before. I just realized. Sorry. Um, we're talking uh, about GM stuff. They they know they know the deal. Yeah. I would <laughs> uh and there's always Grognar boxes, so always you can always tell your GM to to use some of those. Yeah. The whole Mag Magirius um like redemption arc is vital to to the progress of, of the story, but you can switch it for any other character if things go wrong with him. Yeah. So don't be afraid to do that because uh, it has happened to me that he died once before being able to reveal uh, what what the plans of the Ordo were. I don't know, use someone else. Uh, not every member of the Ordo is um, named in the in the book. And you have a lot of NPCs that are named, so you can pick that. I don't know. You can say the the high priest of Sigma is part of the Ordo, or I don't know. Uh, perhaps the guild, the Teamsters guild master. Yeah. It'd be really easy to replace. By that. the way, who's called Bender? I had my my last party visit visit Master Bender, and that was a laugh. <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, we, I, I feel like he's not necessarily like a, a dead end if something happens to Megarius. Yeah. You, you can replace that pretty... Because all you really need him for is to, to, to make that connection when Gideon kills him to make it real, you know, give them more reason to hate Gideon, and then he leads them to the warehouse where the ritual is. As long as somebody gives them that information that, oh, we have to go to this warehouse to stop this from happening whatever it might be that's happening because they don't they don't still don't know yeah that's the end game and remember that that part of the story will go on even without the characters if they never find the clues to to go to warehouse 13 the ritual will take place the rift will open and another totally different set of of, of things will start happening and the players will will have to to navigate through them it's fun yeah. but right. just have that in mind the the whole uh, the whole bog and half and shadows of the bog and half and module is to allow the players to arrive to that uh, time and date more prepared with more information mainly uh, the thing is going to happen either way either if it's interrupted by them or if they don't have any clue so if you really want them to be there and they don't really have any clue what I did once, and it was just spectacular, was I had um, a dwarf Middenball team visit the city during the Schaffenfest to play what? an exhibition match with the local Bogenhafen Middenball team. And That's the match awesome. would be played uh, uh, after the sunset in the last day of the, Bogen, uh, of the Schaffenfest on an improvised pitch outside of the city close to the Schaffenfest and the ritual involved uh, sacrificing the players and the pitch was the pentagram oh, no. 
and then the, that's awesome the rift opened and a, a big lord of change started crawling outside of the blood bowl sorry medium bowl pitch and it was amazing <laughs> it, like um it was spectacular that's and, and and everyone running back inside the city hundreds of people that had gathered to watch the match so don't so be afraid great. to change the place of the of the ritual either yeah, I mean, they put it in the warehouse. I feel like it kind of makes sense, a place that's usually pretty abandoned. It's it's isolated. Uh, but yeah, I think you could put it almost anywhere that they wouldn't just get caught by whoever. Yeah. If anything, if you go for the Binnable pitch, perhaps change the first place where the ritual was supposed to happen because it's weird that they will do it in a very secluded room in the middle of the sewers and suddenly it's out in the open in front of everyone but yeah. i have big plans for this one that when when i run it uh, for my my show's party i will turn the order septenarius into a slanesh cult yeah and i will make the cheerleaders be the members of the order septenarius <laughs> The ones that that are sacrificing a, in a six point uh, star there in the pitch. I sometimes find it kind of lame that so much uh, um, attention is given to Cinch in all of Cubicle Seven's uh, releases. And Absolutely. So few to the other gods. I mean, there's some Slanesh, a little bit of corn in Rough Nights and Hard Days, and Nurgle is barely mentioned basically yeah it's a little frustration i've had as well where it seems like every time it's something chaos it's zinch i get that he's it's the easiest one to deal with and especially in like in urban settings are the easiest to hide and their their goals are usually really abstract whereas something like slanesh is usually pretty you know one-dimensional but I feel like it's something that, that you could change up a bit. I, I would like to see more of the other gods, especially Nurgle and Korn, because they're they're hardly there at all. I don't know, man. The 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 cult that's in Heart of Glass, a module in Uber Strike Adventures, written by Ben Seri. Uh, it's a Slanesh cult uh, formed mostly by Watchmen, and it's like a kind of a fight club, you know, that film and book. Okay, I like that idea. I've actually just started reading that adventure, but I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, there's like a fight club, and they get together to... They glorify combat and that other aspect of Slanesh that doesn't have to do with nakedness and, and lewdness, you know? Because Slanesh is about some other things too. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I, I liked the way Ben Seri covered that it's a it's one of the the best uh Uber Strike adventure modules in my opinion too but we are not here to talk about that one <laughs> okay uh what should we cover perhaps uh coming out of enemy in shadows right uh, I don't remember if I said this during the stream or if I told you when, when we were talking earlier, but if the ritual finally takes place and they don't interrupt it in any way, we will have a, a province in turmoil. Uh, you will really, the, the characters really will get to see what the perfectly oiled mach a war machinery of the Empire looks like with uh, oh, regiments marching from Aldorf and other places to... Bogenhafen and the Imperial Navy sending their ships and wizards, I'm sure Balthasar Gelt or some other uh, important wizard would fly that way almost immediately. Not the Emperor for reasons that let's not spoil. Uh, yeah, right. But yeah, probably or, or the Grand Theogonist or Balthasar Gelt, some important people, perhaps even uh, Espet von Draken from Nuln, the 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 wizard of, of death because this is no no this is quite a big deal having a rift open so close to the capital they will probably want to address it as soon as possible yeah and i like how they didn't skimp on this in the book there's a couple pages describing what could happen you know what happens if they fail to stop the ritual and how big of a deal that is and even saying like okay if they get on a boat and get out of there 
you know, th these kind of things, they can interact, they can, you know, have this happen to them. But if they get on a coach or go off by foot, you know, they can see these things on the road as well. I thought that was cool and, and nice to have that, you know, that inspiration there. Yeah. For, if that does happen to your party. It's kind of, it, there's only like a couple ways it can go wrong for the beer belly. Uh, so it's probably you're leaving by boat, which is nice because... There's a weird thing about a boat sailing through one of these cities, which are divided by two, by a river. Imagine a boat just slowly sailing away from the city and the devastation happening on the streets with demons running people down on the streets, uh, buildings burning, and you just calmly and swiftly floating downstream while everything, every of those things happen. You may have an attack from some flying demon that you could keep your like in your tracks. It's it's really an amazing scene. Half of the time, I I hope the players will fail to stop the ritual. To be honest, I I kind of hope they would have failed in our game because I was I thought that'd be a super cool thing to show and how how de not demoralizing but like. It would be super exciting. It would have been a crazy thing to happen. So I was kind of like rooting for them not to do it. But it, it was when they do stop the ritual, it's still an amazing moment in a, in a much more subdued way watching Tugan get like sucked into the portal. And that still has lasting effects on the party. Seeing this portal open up and this eyeball and everything and then all the people catching on fire and whatnot. It's crazy. Yeah, it is amazing. Did they allow? I don't remember if in Good Papa they allowed the human to be sacrificed. They did, right? Because else, I think they stopped. No, did they? I don't remember right now. I can't remember. I think it was they were too more late. more than a year a, a year ago, right? Yeah, already. I don't forget. <laughs> yeah, that specific. I think they stopped before it happened. I don't. Oh. I can't remember if they got out of the warehouse though, because it was burning. Uh, one thing before we jump quickly to to make a quick um, a quick review of the companion, uh, do check in the in the sandbox part of the of the of the campaign book. Do check the Henrik Temple and the Bogenauer Temple uh, because Henrik is a a god of trade and Bogenauer is the patron god of the river Bogen, which the city uh, is built next to. So they're, they're really important and they can give you a couple of ideas. For instance, uh, I know there's a PDF release called Shrines of the Empire or something like that, yeah. where uh, a couple of them could work with some tricks as Bogenauer or Heinrich uh, Shrines, and it could give you some extra, extra fun. <laughs> uh, okay, so the Companion. Again, not mandatory to have it if you want to run this adventure but it certainly helps it also has Good. has some some modules that are included uh, and at the end of the book which are plenty of fun especially the one that uh, is like a robin hood story with um, these old laws that have their own castle in the middle of the forest which is really really amazing and there's a couple more than there's one that's really short about the ghost, which is funny. I don't a couple know. little just there there are two little just encounters basically in NPC and their little story of whatever is going on just to again breathe a little bit more life into the world. These weird things that can happen on the road. Oh, the affair of the hidden jewel melodrama yeah. with a thick plot is that <laughs> that's the, the black the, arrows. The, that one's amazing. I totally recommend it. And there's and also I love how it's written. It's so funny. It's like the, the plot thickens and the plot becomes even more thick and the plot, you can't even swim through it now kind of thing in the <laughs> headings. It's yeah. just funny. And, and you also have the, how is it called? The Sioux, the Pandemonium Carnival, which is more or less the same thing that uh, Dr. Mal Malthusius has going on. So you can do a quick switcheroo there and make yeah. the party meet Dr. Malthusius on the road somewhere else. And it can be, can be fun. The way I played, I I chained this one, the Pandemonium Carnival, with the one uh, from the Hidden Jewel, because there's uh, a missing beast in the Pandemonium Carnival, 
and that beast can be the same found in the dungeons of the hidden jewel mystery thing which is a okay. um, okay. lustrian uh, cold one this velociraptor thing is you know the, the dark elves yeah, right called the carnivorous snapper but yeah. it's really just a cold one it's a cold one <laughs> we know what it is uh yeah that's about it and the rest of the book uh, on top of having plenty of npcs that can be switched in the campaign yeah i've used a few yeah i know you you have some notes on them go ahead while i look at the oh, other just things the, the, the... There are dozens probably NPCs in here, and they all have. You can use their little stories, or just use I for I use their image and stat block, and just kind of throw them in different places. But there's there's so much to use there. Uh, I I think it's really cool. Uh, the chapters like all roads lead to Bogenhofen, but you can just cherry pick what you need for your game. Yeah, I think my favorite thing out of this book. Players aren't a huge fan of it, uh, but the expanded mutation tables are just you know chef's kiss yeah like just more options there i i absolutely love it instead of having you know they they're at least twice as big as the the tables in the the main the core book and then they even break it down where you can roll by god um they're like okay this person seems to be you know more corrupted by corn so i'm going to roll on the corn table uh version of it and see what you know cherry picked for that god they might get and of course, broken down into physical and mental, uh, which is just cool. I I love that extra mutation table. Is yes, please. You, you love tables, yeah. right? The what? You love tables. I do like tables. Yeah, I like rolling on tables. I like getting random stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this book also super expands on chaos magic. Like gives it an actual lore, and the lore of Zinch as well. Uh, but it gives you a lot more for Dar, and then the whole career yeah and the career is not bad at all and even if even if you're not using the career or you're not offering one of your players to take this career which is a very risky move i don't recommend oh, yeah. you do this unless you're planning on some sort of setup where where you have a player be half a gm of sorts or a player that's um that agrees on on scripting some parts of of their interaction with the campaign or at least having some boundaries because else it can go to shit real quick with all the things that it can do but one thing that i really appreciate about that career is one talent they added which makes sense i don't know why you don't have access in level one you should uh, which is double life they took the secret identity uh, talent from the from the core rulebook and they brought it like a whole to a whole new level because you can have a second career and while you have that talent you can have both careers at the same time which is pretty handy if you're a wizard of the powers of chaos of course but i have offered it to players in other circumstances too for instance i have a noble that's dabbling with magic and wants to become a witch but it wouldn't make sense for her to drop to brass three only because she likes to say weird words for weird things to happen. So it wouldn't make sense for her to change to the career of a peasant, for example, which is the witch. So I just let her grab the double life uh, talent and now he's picked, she's picked the, the witch career and she has both. And it has some very simple rules as to how, how being able to manage both. I like that a lot. Yeah, it makes this career playable for a character, not just uh, uh, an enemy. Yeah, and you can even uh, go halfway and, and grab that other talent that it introduces, the one that's like a, a Tsinichan worm that gets stuck in your mind and teaches you a single spell from any lore. Again, Ooh. taking the witch talent to a whole new level. It's It's really interesting what they offer here. Okay, and besides that, there's a chapter that helps you understand the Empire and how it's governed. Uh, if you're not a historic fan and you do not know how the Holy Roman Empire worked, perhaps the Empire can be confusing in its uh, the way that their state is designed. Yeah. Uh, some Ooh, additional info. Travel. Sorry, Sorry, what? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I said the whole next chapter about travel 
and and all that, which I think is super mostly overland travel it deals with, but I think is super useful. Bunch of rules for for different animals and stuff, different horses and things. Um, I like that chapter a lot as well. I like that they expanded a bit on mounted combat, which is barely mentioned in the core rulebook, and having yeah. so many careers that depend on it. I I felt like it was lackluster originally, but it kind of kind of expands a bit on that. And it is neat to see that. Yeah. And I think that's about it. We made it. It may not have lasted 60 minutes like we first intended, but we made it in an hour and a half. And not too bad. We covered a lot of a lot of stuff. I noticed that it started stuttering in Twitch at some point. So from that point onward, I started recording myself. So we'll check that video to see if it's um, video on demand worthy to upload and else we will upload my backup, okay? Sounds good. And Dan, should we already confirm that we want to do this for Death on the Reich? Oh, absolutely. Okay, just let me uh, get my myself deeper into it because I have a couple of parties that are playing it and one of them is reaching the, the final stages. So I would like to play it fully before, before doing this for, for that one. But it was a pleasure, and I'm glad you took took uh, me on on that on that offer of making this. Yeah, yeah you, you suggested, and I was like, "That sounds great." I'm sure a lot of people would like yeah, want to run it, but might find it a little daunting or intimidating. So let's let's talk about it. And yeah, we should think about a clickbaity title for it. Uh, one on one things you need to know before running <laughs> enemy within <laughs> the enemy in shadows. Okay, people, it's been a pleasure. I hope for those watching this later that it's uh, helpful. And we'll see you on the next time. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, Lemmy. We'll see you around.